Dr. Jayashankar needs no introduction. Um, he is um, a very well-known face. And uh, uh, strangely enough, because you normally don't expect uh, uh, foreign ministers uh, to do this, but strangely enough, he's also the, uh, the subject of many viral videos and memes and uh, uh, the number of people who get uh, WhatsApp forwards featuring Dr. Jayashankar uh, is staggering. So I, I think it's a very, very uh, unique position for a foreign minister. Um, thank you for being here in this very special uh, in the Sun Times Leadership Summit. It's our 100th uh, anniversary, the centenary of Hindustan Times. Uh, and the prime minister was here this morning and he spoke about uh, India and how it has changed um, and what is happening in the country. And you travel around the world. Uh, what is the outside in perspective of India right now? Uh, Mr. Kumar, first of all, let me say what a great pleasure it is to be here and my congratulations, my felicitations on this important anniversary. Thank you. Um, what, how does the world see India? Well, uh, look, uh, I guess to some degree uh, they look at the political stability in India at a time when the world is actually undergoing a lot of political instability. Uh, particularly, I think, uh, you know, in democratic societies today, it's not easy to get re-elected and to be re-elected twice uh, is uh, a very big deal. I think they also look at us economically. Again, the world's pretty challenging, you know, to, to be in that seven, eight percent zone and not just be in the zone as a one-off, but you have like decades ahead. And there's a lot of business enthusiasm today, investment enthusiasm today uh, for India, a lot of interest. Uh, that I would say is two. Uh, three, uh, the technology and to some extent, you know what the PM spoke about, the talent side. Uh, the sense today that actually the world is poised to enter this era of AI, of chips, of space, of drones. And uh, this, you're going to need, you know, countries and partners who uh, are of relevance here. Uh, and this is partly also linked to the supply chain diversification uh, and, you know, the digital, uh, digital partnership uh, issue. The fourth, I would say, is actually demography, because, uh, uh, I mean, for me, it's been interesting last few years, the number of foreign ministers or government leaders who have expressed interest in uh, finding pathways, uh, you know, for Indians to work or uh, to, to study or to, uh, you know, in some way contribute, that has grown. In fact, even historically, uh, immigration suspicious societies. Uh, today, uh, I guess because of the, uh, you know, the, the, their own demographic challenges are looking at us uh, very differently. And finally, you know, my sense is the world is also expecting more from India. You know, that is, that is also a challenge for our foreign policy that if you are the fifth or hopefully be better... Third. Yeah. yeah, then, you know, the, the world has a different expectation from India, which was 10th or 15th, than it is when you are... Like 15th. what? What would it expect? Well, it depends. Uh, I think uh, today, uh, neighbors expect that in times of trouble, we will stand by them. Uh, beyond neighborhood, you know, people expect in some way you would help. Uh, so if you have a situation in the Gulf, or you have a, you know, a natural disaster in Africa uh, or something in Southeast Asia. Uh, the, there were days when most expectations were pegged around the US and to some extent Europe, you can say the developed world. Uh, I think those have pared down because other changes are taking place in the world. Uh, and uh, they, there is a search for more local uh, or fraternity solutions. 
Uh, and there, there are a lot of expectations uh, uh, of India. Uh, it could be in a crisis, but it could also be in terms of development. I mean, people feel uh, the world's very cognizant of what we have achieved digitally. Uh, so this idea, you know, India is not just seen as tech working for other people. It's also an embrace of technology by Indian society and the uh, improvements of governance which have taken place. There's a lot of interest in other parts of the world saying, you know, we'd like to work with your companies or work with your government to figure out. So therefore, bigger contributions, greater responsibilities, more uh, economic interest, more political respect. Uh, even in conflict situations, maybe a sense, okay, where are you and can you, you know, what are you doing about it? So it's a, it's a combination of all of this. Great. Uh... That was a loosener. I mean, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar, like most Indians, likes cricket. Um, so uh, that was a slow full toss outside the off stump so that he could get his eye in. And now for the more meaty part of the discussion. Uh, the US election is over and uh, Trump is won. Um, not only has he won, he's got the House, he's got the Senate. Um, what does this election tell us about America and how do you expect a new Republican administration to reshape the U.S.? Well, I think the election tells us a lot about America. Uh, for starters, it tells us that the initial, you know, the reasons why Trump won the first term, uh, many of those concerns and priorities have actually intensified in these years, they have not gone away. So therefore, if if uh, uh, Trump is getting larger numbers, uh, it also means that those very trends uh, which, which drive it uh, have become much more serious. So what are those trends? I, I think uh, uh, it is a concern in America that globalization has been harmful. Globalization is currently uh, currently there, uh, has not served American interest, has been in many ways uh, uh, detrimental or harmful to different segments of American society. Uh, it has uh, made them less secure, uh, both psychologically and, you know, in terms of uh, conceptually how, how they view the nation. Uh, it's also made them, I think, rethink about the terms of engagement with the world. That, uh, you know, uh, a time when America felt it was big enough and empowered enough and resourced enough to actually take care of every global problem. I think that era is behind. I mean, Americans today are asking themselves, saying, you know, if uh, things are broke at home, why are my resources going outside to fix it? Yeah, you've spoken about this. Yeah. Dominance so, and generosity, those were the terms yeah. that you used. So, so you know, uh, America is asking hard questions of American leaders and in a sense of American policies over the last few decades. So uh, to a great extent, I would say um, uh, the verdict is also a reflection on the outcomes of policies which many previous American presidents pursued, certainly in the last 20 odd years. Uh, you have uh, said this before, like I said, you warned about the US turning uh, inwards. Um, this is something that has also come at a time when uh, China is becoming very, very assertive globally. Um, will a insular US posture Affect us in some way? Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Hang on. You use two words, inwards and insular. I think you are um, somewhat misreading what I am saying. You know, the United States is seeking, uh, President Trump is seeking to reset the terms. That doesn't mean he's turning his back on the world. He's telling the world that, you know, uh, the, there's a different deal on offer. Uh, that uh, what, you know, uh, your access to the American economy, your expectation of American resources and activities, uh, the cost to America, all these will be, will change. 
uh, so i think it's very important you know because look there are debates in america like in any society political debates are always overdrawn because each party wants to portray the other as an extremist i don't think it's uh, feasible or it is actually anybody's case that america would turn its back on the world what america would say is there is a world i mean you if you are the number one power you have to remain engaged with the world but the terms you are offering to the world are going to be different from the terms uh, which were there uh, and that i think is going to be the disruption because the the rest of the world has slid into a habit you know some are more habituated because they were closer to america uh, some are less habituated like us because uh, we didn't have the same intensity of ties or the extent of dependence or reliance uh, which say allies in many cases had uh, so we are going to see in different uh, domains uh, us take up different kinds of positions each one of which will have a global impact and each one of it will be calculated for its global consequences so it will be very global it will be differently global it would its uh, its terms on offer would be significantly different during his uh, first term uh, president trump reset uh, the relationship with china to a significant extent and and the next government i think the next administration carried that forward um, especially in trade um, do you see more of that coming you know um, if you interpret the american political verdict as the electorate's disenchantment or unhappiness with the impact of globalization on them obviously when you speak about globalization you have to talk about china because china has been the big beneficiary of 25 years of a certain model of globalization uh, to which in america the clinton administration acquiesced in the first place now so so if you are saying i'm not going to get i'm not going to let my uh, manufacturing be hollowed out more if you are going to say i'm not i'm going to have to deal with you know uh, competition on a fairer basis if you are going to say i'm going to rebuild my industry obviously each one of these has consequences for us china and the dilemma of the us i should also add is not unique i think a lot of other countries face their own It's versions the of the dilemma including us you know a lot of our challenges whether it is on trade whether it is on fta whether it is on china are not dissimilar they're not identical but they're not dissimilar under the biden administration um, we saw three major breakthroughs as far as india was concerned um and i want to speak about each one of these in turn uh, one was a focus on uh, critical and emerging technologies and and there seem to be greater willingness from the us to share that what is the future of iset under trump in your opinion you know uh, again it flows from what we had discussed uh, the united states obviously would be much more self aware of its economic and manufacturing interests because also um, the nature of technology links it to national security so today manufacturing national technology national security cannot be compartmentalized okay and that's part of the digital uh, and ai revolution <coughs> now the us big though it is still needs global partners it cannot do everything itself it doesn't want to do everything itself but it cannot be agnostic about where it is done also you know in a digital era who has your data what they do with it uh, are there uh, you know are there uh, uh, angles to it which have uh, security implications is very obvious consideration so i think we have already the logic of i set is in different domains of high sensitivity to forge partnerships between countries 
governments and societies which have a higher level of trust, where you actually uh, relate to each other uh, and therefore are comfortable with sourcing from there or uh, outsourcing from there or partnering out there. I, I think you're going to get see that as a as a structural trend. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, my, my own sense is uh, if uh, President Trump is determined to make America more competitive uh, and brings to it a strong uh, element of business viability, I think such an America will actually look for partners with whom it can actually work in a complementary uh, fashion. So to my mind, the reworking of supply chains uh, <laughs> and the engineering of new digital chains, uh, I think will continue. Great. I, I think you've answered not just the first point I wanted to make, but the third question I wanted to ask you, because one of the other big changes we've seen is really the um, fact that the US sees India as an important partner when it comes to diversifying supply chains. The second change that we've seen in our relationship is that uh, uh, it's, it's moved, it seems to have moved from a uh, buyer-seller relationship when it comes to defense uh, to one that involves co-production, co-development. Um, do you see uh, Trump's focus on manufacturing in the U.S., insistence on other countries buying American, leading to a clash of these objectives? You know, uh, forget Trump for a moment. I think we should be worrying about ourselves. You know, we didn't have the, uh, the focus on manufacturing and make in India before. So why is this happening now? It is happening now because till a few years ago, we were content to import from outside. And in this country, I mean, let's be honest, uh, we've actually made manufacturing very hard to do. So once it's because now the make in India is getting traction and make in India is also getting into the uh, defense segment that we are you are even asking this question. If you and I had sat here in 2013, you wouldn't have asked me this question. So the, the point is, look, uh, today we are at a stage where it is absolutely essential that we expand our manufacturing. Without that manufacturing, we will not create that industrial tech, you know, culture. We will not be able to generate technologies of our own. And we will essentially end up as a market for other people. Now, my sense is when you have a partner like India, if we are able to get things right, which means making it easier to do business, having the infrastructure, uh, creating the technology institutions, uh, encouraging the startups, uh, improving the business and employment culture of this country, it makes us a worthwhile partner. If there is a worthwhile partner, the United States will be in a market for worthwhile partners. I mean, again, I, to that extent, I come back to Trump. You know, Trump is not against international partnerships. I mean, the best I understand Trump, he says, you know, pay your fare as you go along. So we are a country which, you know, which pays its fair share. If we are able to bring things to the table, there are obvious benefits for it for America as well. Moving to uh, China. Um, how do you see this uh, pact on disengagement with China that we have? Do you, do you see it as a tactical thaw in ties? Um, or do you see it as uh, the beginnings of a possible strategic reset? Because you, our border issues remain unresolved, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's clearly not defined on either side. So are we beginning to see a strategic reset? I see disengagement as disengagement. Nothing more, nothing less. If you look at our uh, current uh, situation with China, we have a issue uh, where our troops are uncomfortably close uh, along the line of actual control, which required us to disengage. And this uh, last understanding of October 21 
is the uh, last one of the disengagement agreements so that you know with its implementation the disengagement part of the problem is addressed after this there is the de-escalation which means you know the massing of troops along the LAC and the all the associated developments with that and um, linked with that the other aspects of the relationship so at this moment you know frankly we are focused on the disengagement where will the disengagement lead us it could lead to, you know it's it's a reasonable supposition that there will be some improvement in the ties but uh, some of the words you used right now i think uh, are uh, sort optimistic. of optimistic uh, um, I mean, perhaps the current situation doesn't necessarily warrant uh, warrant that at this time. Um, one of the things that we've noticed and is uh, over the last uh, year or so, uh, ever since the economic survey came out and it spoke about um, the need to relax investment restrictions that had been placed on China once. Uh, the relations between the two really went downhill. Um, the perception we have from the outside is that there seems to be a little bit of tussle between the economic and security arms of uh, your government. Uh, the economic arm would want closer and deeper relations with China and um, you would insist that it needs to be driven from a security perspective. Is that an accurate way of looking at it? Uh, look, uh... I think an accurate way of looking at it is that in uh, every government, uh, different ministries have different responsibilities and flowing from that responsibility, they have a point of view. Uh, so you refer to an economic survey. Uh, in effect, there would be a national security survey, which you may not see in public, which would have a national security point of view. What the Ministry of External Affairs does is uh, in a way, it's an integrator of all points of views and takes a overall uh, balanced uh, approach. So if somebody has a point of view, they, we look at that point of view. We don't say you can't have that point of view, but a point of view at the end of the day is not a policy decision. Um, very simply put, and I know it's, it's very difficult to you know narrow down in terms of definitions. Um, I think uh, one reason why a lot of people struggle, even in terms of how they analyze the situation, is uh, how does India view China? Um, at one point in time, of course, there was this perspective of these two Asian brothers, and you know how the century would be belong to them. Uh, but how do you view it? Is it an adversary? Uh, is it a competitor in certain perspectives? What is it? Uh, I'm tempted to say, read my book. <laughs> you would you would get in each book a chapter on China, <laughs> which would give you uh, some sense. But uh, I'll give you a short, condensed uh, form of the answer. Look, you have two countries, quite unique, uh, partly by the size of the population, partly by the uh, civilizational characteristics of the, of the state uh, uh, by the length of their history, by their, uh, by their, you know, uh, by their previous contributions and standing in the world, which went through a certain downturn in their respective histories. And today, these two countries are on the upswing again. Now, it so happens that they're located next to each other, which makes the management of a, you know, if uh, there is a, a, a changing situation, uh, a change is difficult to handle at best of times. Two changes are that much more complex. Two changes next to each other are even more complex. So how do you get a, a sort of a equilibrium or a stability when two big countries are changing so profoundly next to each other, I think is, 
is a, a conundrum which has been very rarely faced uh, in in um, you know in human history. Uh, so uh, it is uh, it is not easy. I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, while we are next to each other, it's also uh, quite obvious that in many ways uh, the societies are also very different from each other. You know, our politics is very different. Our economics is very different. Uh, what we regard as merits and virtues need not always be the same. Uh, so, uh, in a way, I would say the mindsets are also different of these two states. So, you have to factor all this in, in making an approach. And that is why it's such a complicated relationship. Um, right at the beginning, in answer to the first question, you, you mentioned uh, that the world also expects things from India. Mm -hmm. And uh, this year itself, we've seen uh, Prime Minister Modi actively get involved in communicating messages between President Putin and Zelensky on the Ukraine war, for instance. Uh, where do you see this going? Um, do we have a role to play in uh, facilitating peace? Uh, yes, I think we do. Uh, Look, when the war started, uh, we took the position that, I mean, this was uh, unfortunate, it was tragic, and we never really thought that the solution would come from the battlefield, okay? Uh, we said it at some point of time, not everybody took it well. Uh, we handle the challenges coming out of the conflict, obviously with our national interest in mind. Not everybody took that very well, uh, but we had what we had. Now, the fact is, uh, into its third year now, it's very clear, it's even clearer that you're not going to get a battlefield-based solution. Resolution. Okay. Now, what are the choices? The choices is to, one is to stay on the sidelines and, uh, you know, say, well, it doesn't concern me. The other is to give broad homilies and leave it at that. A third one is to back one side or the other, which some countries are doing. And maybe a fourth one is to say, okay, let me apply myself to this uh, tragic situation. Let me try to do something about it. Maybe it will work, maybe it will not, but why should I not at least, you know, do my best? Uh, so how do you go about it? Uh, one, uh, of course, to utilize the uh, fact that there are today very few countries and very few prime ministers or presidents who have the ability to go to Moscow and go to Kiev and, uh, you know, call up Putin and call up Zelensky. And we should, we should uh, you know, use that uh, advantage. The second is then to apply yourself to the task. So what we have been doing, if you see, we had the elections in June. In June, uh, Prime Minister Modi met Zelensky in Italy. In July, he met Putin in Moscow. Uh, in August, he met Zelensky again in, uh, in uh, Kiev. Uh, then uh, we engaged the Russians. Uh, NSA Dawal went to Moscow. In September, Prime Minister met Zelensky again in uh, New York. In October, he met Putin in uh, Kazan. So what we've been trying to do is to have conversations uh, in good faith uh, with the understanding that uh, uh, common points or uh, um, convergences in those conversations, uh, if the other party was comfortable, we were prepared to share it uh, with, with uh, the other side. Uh, now, uh, it's not going to be easy. Uh, to the best of, you know, uh, there are, uh, there have been efforts by individual countries to work out individual problems. You know, the Turks, for example, uh, did the Grain Corridor. Uh, and uh, some other countries did the POW exchange. Uh, so, there have been occasions when individual problems have been addressed. But in terms of actually uh, looking at the fundamental issue, the conflict, 
uh, I don't think there are too many others. We have not put forward a peace plan. We don't think it's our business to do that. Uh, our business is to try to find a way of bringing these two countries to a point where they are able to engage. Because at the end of the day, they have to engage with each other. Others cannot solve the problem if they are not willing to solve it. And I must tell you, as we embarked on this exercise in the last few months, uh, uh, there was initially more skepticism. Uh, I think over a period of time, uh, uh, more and more countries, including Western countries, actually have told us, please uh, keep at it. Uh, we see a use for it. And I draw your attention to the fact that uh, Chancellor Schultz yesterday spoke to President Putin for the first time after the conflict began. So you can see what is the direction in which uh, the world is moving. I think the world is, uh, in a way, sort of exhausted. I mean, this conflict has exacted a huge price, obviously from the two protagonists, but, but from, from, everyone, else from everyone else as well. Uh, it is a time when there is a global demand for some kind of uh, solution. And uh, I think we would be stepping up to our responsibilities and the world's expectations by trying to do something. Great. Um, I have many more questions, but I have we are out of time, catch. but you have a flight to catch. Uh, Dr. Jay Shankar, thank you very much. Thank you.